All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, latest episode of uh, Scrubbing the Skies, the webinar series of the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, as always, I'm Will Burns. I am the host of the series, and I am the co-director uh, of the Institute. Uh, one of the most uh, challenging questions that we have in the context of, of carbon dioxide uh, removal, uh, either on the uh, compliance side or the voluntary side, uh, is this ongoing issue of permanence, right, in terms of, uh, of, of, of sequestration. Uh, this was brought most recently in the market relief by uh, the uh, efforts of the supervisory committee of the Article 6.4 uh, uh, body within the Paris Agreement to uh, address that very issue, right? And uh, and the fact that in in various iterations we've seen different uh, incarnations of 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 permanence, uh, different uh, ways to measure permanence and assess it, and different conclusions speaks volumes to how this is an important ongoing sort of issue. And and indeed, as we uh, look at the CDR landscape and realize uh, that a lot of the uh, far more permanent sort of solutions are still on the horizon uh, due to economic issues, due to technological issues, due to questions of, of risk assessment. Uh, it, is, it is certainly pertinent to ask the question, uh, what do we do with, uh, with CDR options that are viable uh, but are clearly less permanent uh, in, in, in nature? And uh, we have a, a, a new study that really tries to grapple in, in granular detail uh, with uh, these issues and provide a, a roadmap for uh, both, I think, the voluntary carbon market, uh, verification uh, uh, organizations, and governments as they seek to address uh, uh, these issues. Uh, the title of the study is Governing Permanence of Carbon Dioxide Removal, a typology of policy measures. It was released in November by CORE2, the greenhouse gas uh, removal uh, hub. And we are fortunate today to have the uh, two authors of that report uh, who will uh, work us through its particulars and then uh, and then answer uh, some questions that uh, uh, that we would have in this uh, context. So first of all, let me introduce our uh, guest today. First of all, uh, Josh Burke, who is a senior policy fellow with the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Uh, welcome, Josh. And Dr. Uh, Felix uh, Chenuet, who is a research associate with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs uh, in uh, Berlin. Uh, welcome to you also, uh, Felix. Uh, so at the outset, uh, as, as usual, uh, we will have uh, initial uh, interventions uh, to uh, present the uh, 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 the bare bones of the uh, report, uh, and then we will proceed to a period of, of question and answer. So with that, I will turn over the floor to uh, Josh. Thank you, Will. Thank you for the invitation to, to present today and uh, yeah, look forward to discussing the report and the, the Q&A after. So uh, I'm just going to move this. OK, so the agenda for today. So I'm going to start with the policy context and the problem. Then I'll talk through the mapping exercise we did to, to, to create this typology, then how the typology can be sequenced in practical policy making then how the different types of measures that we map could be bundled together for different types of CDR with different types of permanence. And then I'll bring this to, uh, to the reality, you know, to, to, to what's actually happening in practice with some of these. Some of the measures are largely theoretical, but some are actually uh, being deployed in public policy. So I'll, I'll highlight that. And then lastly, to, to get, uh, I'm sure we'll stimulate some discussion. We'll, we'll talk through our conceptual framework for thinking around fungibility uh, of different types of carbon removal, which is a definitely a very contested topic. So this work was born out of uh, 
my last six months working for the UK government it doesn't represent UK government policy, but it's very much in line with what the UK is thinking about at the moment, and indeed the EU with regards to integrating CDR into different types of policy architectures. And I think as we get into this, setting up our store fairly early on, I think Felix and I, our view is that um, with regard to permanence, we're also already heading in a direction um, of integration to, to carbon markets. And whether we think that is a good thing or a bad thing, this is the position we're, we're finding ourselves in. And so the, the kind of genesis of this work is about really thinking through if this is the direction of travel, how do we, how do we make sure it's the most, uh, we, it's done in the most responsible manner. So that's kind of our, the basis for, for this work. Okay, so the policy context. So as many of you will be familiar with, the, the COP28 failed to resolve disagreements over the rules for global carbon trading. Um, and what we really need is these rules to be urgently devised and adopted to avoid replicating past errors that we've seen in both the voluntary carbon market and earlier iterations of the clean development mechanism. National policy making is key. We're seeing different jurisdictions starting to develop different types of policy in the United States, moving forward with more subsidies and procurement. Uh, in the EU and the UK, discussions around compliance markets are gathering greater traction. Unsurprisingly, given, some, given that there are large compliance markets in operation. And thinking about these. Excuse me, excuse me, Josh. I hate to inter, uh, uh, interfere with your presentation, but do you have slides that are supposed to be up on the screen? Yes. I don't, oh, I'm sorry. I don't see them. Okay. Let me figure out what's going on. Uh, uh -huh. Are we, is that sharing? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, perfect, apologies for that. So, brief recap of the agenda and now the policy context. So yes, the UK and the EU, they are moving forward with compliance markets. There are three principal reasons why these uh, this type of policy measure is gaining traction. First of all, it's a helpful way of involving emitters from sectors that are otherwise not playing a large role in, in demand at the moment. So the hard to abate sectors, which are slightly absent from the uh, the purchasing of, of CDR at the moment. The second is that, uh, particularly in the UK, uh, it's a fiscally constrained uh, environment that we are operating in. And so using polluter pays or carbon markets is a helpful way of, way of channeling finance to fund CDR uh, in a way that is off the, the government balance sheet. And then thirdly, we're seeing the cap in the EU and the UK declining and with a declining cap, you are likely to get uh, increased volatility. And if there is a, a more volatile market that could undermine uh, the role of the EU and the UK ETS in climate policy uh, as prices might spike. So adding CDR into these markets enhances liquidity and can enhance the salience of the, 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 the policy mechanism. And I think to some extent, that's really what's driving that. We have a, a, a policy that UK and EU uh, policymakers have spent a lot of time devising and invested in it. And so integrating CDI into this market is a helpful way of continuing its operation. So that's kind of the, the policy context that we're arriving in. So it's probably not the optimal first best solution to uh, incentivizing the net negative economy, but it's, uh, it's where we are today. So the problem, so as you're familiar with, CDR has very different uh, characteristics, both in terms of cost, but also importantly in the context of today, durability and the risk of reversal. Direct air capture with geological storage can store carbon for 10,000 years or more and with a very low risk of reversal, whereas land-based removals such as afforestation have a much shorter duration of carbon storage up to 100 years based on the IPC 
seed classifications. So because of this, putting different types of CDR with different types of durability and reversible risk into a compliance market has several issues or raises several issues. First of all, non-permanent CO2 is not equivalent to permanent CO2 and is a continuous obligation to remove. Lower cost land-based removals might put downward pressure on the carbon price and a lower carbon price might undermine the business case for more expensive CDR. And thirdly, there is a there is a difficulty of establishing legitimacy and equivalence between fossil emissions and non-permanent uh, uh, emissions, uh, non-permanent CDR. And overall, this has implications for the policy design, as we'll get into now. So the first step in our, in our paper was to map the different types of uh, measures that are there to deal with different types of problems that arise from uh, varying degrees of permanence. So for today's talk, I'm only going to keep it high level at the at the kind of uh, the numbered uh, components. But in the discussion at the end, if people want to get into the more detailed bits, then we can do so. So there are five measures that we outline in this typology. The first are foundational measures, and by that we're talking about monitoring, reporting, and verification. The second set of measures are de-risking measures. That is essentially private sector initiatives, such as insurance or ratings agencies, where investors or buyers can go out to utilize these services to get a better sense of the risk profile attached to certain CDR projects. The second is durability measures or reversal measures, and this is what we are, and buffer pools are what uh, underpin this. The fourth measure is fungibility measures. So these are measures to uh, try and determine some kind of equivalence between permanent and non-permanent uh, CDR. And the output of this are equivalence ratios. So for example, you can use economics to determine that a non-permanent CDR, you need three of those to equate to one permanent CDR. That is an arbitrary example here, but that's the kind of output you get from some of these fungibility measures. And then lastly, we have liability measures, and that is legal obligations to continually remove. So in the event of a reversal, you have a legal mechanism that gives you recourse to uh, ensure that a developer either goes out and procures uh, removals um, in real time, so contemporaneously, or they are uh, obligated to, to replant their project or, 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 or continue removing other means. So that's the kind of five measures at a high level. Underneath, as I said, there are various different types of methodologies that sit under there. It's quite cumbersome to talk through, but we can maybe leave that for the, for the Q&A, but I want to just outline those five high-level measures for now. And the way we think of this typology is it's, it's a one-tier typology. So at the apex, we have MRV. That really is what we consider the most important uh, measure in the overall typology. Uh, and so MRV is important for policy integration, for certainty that the projects are doing what it's intended to do, which in turn helps investors to, to flow and helps channel finance. And it also enhance, increases trust in the, the CDR method, which helps to potentially overcome any public uh, or political opposition to CDR. So really, MRV is absolutely critical. And then the second uh, rank of measures, so all of them, de-risking measures, durability measures, fungibility and liability measures, they're all of equal weighting, if you like, in our typology. And so, yeah, MRV sits at the apex and then underneath um, all the others sit. And what we see currently, particularly in the VCM, the voluntary carbon market, is we're already seeing uh, MRV in operation. We're seeing de-risking measures in operation. So that's the use of insurance or ratings agencies and we're seeing buffer pools already in operation in the VCMs. We're also seeing it for some uh, forestry uh, projects uh, in compliance markets, but uh, in terms of uh, carbon removals in the voluntary market at the moment. 
And what we envision as, although MRV is the apex and the most important, both MRV and liability measures, so numbers one and five, we think they're both critical in both market structures, so both the compliance market and the voluntary market. And as we move from voluntary markets to compliance markets, the salience of some of these uh, mechanisms will, 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 will change um, over time. And indeed, as will the role of companies. So in the uh, voluntary carbon market with a private registry, in that transition to compliance markets, governments are likely take it, will likely take over that role of uh, designing the registry. So not just in terms of governance mechanisms, but also the role of different actors will change as we make this transition from voluntary to compliance. Okay, so the second step after the mapping exercise is to propose a sequencing of, of policies. And so this is really for policymakers thinking about uh, applying these in order to integrate CDR into different types of policy structures. So following the typology with, a, with MRV sitting at the apex, as, as, uh, as would follow, MRV is the first stage of all uh, in the policy sequencing. So governments and policymakers should think about getting the certification schemes uh, right in the first instance, and that is the gateway, as if you, if you like, to integrating types of uh, different types of CDR into different policy mechanisms. And so stage two is thinking about integrating CDR into non-market-based policy instruments. So uh, subsidies or public procurement, here we need to govern for the risk of reversal and a government could either use de-risking measures, durability measures or liability measures. And so that is important for the current phase of policy, at least in, in the UK where we're seeing a, um, government subsidies come in first in a way as a way of bringing down costs to enable that subsequent integration into carbon markets at a later date and so stage three follows that similar kind of sequencing if governments are seeking to use compliance markets they need to create fungibility uh, between cdr and emissions allowances and so stage three of the policy making process is creating tradability and we're using tradability and fungibility here interchangeably so at the, at the kind of high level governments need to make cdr allowances fungible and that can be done through the application of all the different types of measures in the uh, typology it's a government decision about what combination they use to create fungibility as fungibility is ultimately a a, a, a question of politics as well as nuanced concepts in economics and climate science is not a easy decision or, or easy thing to do. So stage three is about uh, creating tradability in order to allow CDR credits to be traded within a compliance market without creating fungibility. It's very difficult to see how a CDR can be create, integrated into a compliance market. Okay, so the next step is to think about how we might group or cluster different types of uh, permanence measures for different types of carbon removal uh, technologies and, and which have varying uh, time frames for how long they store the carbon for. So on the right hand side we have uh, CDR that stores carbon for 10,000 years or more because uh, it's more permanent it has a lower regulatory burden and so we've illustrated this with um, a fewer measures from the typology here as we outlined at the start mrv and liability measures are crucial across all different types of cdr and maybe because this is more permanent it can have a lower regulatory burden with just mrv and liability measures all of this is illustrative and this is just our way of showing that with more uh with higher risk of reversal equals higher regulatory burden. This kind of exact combination is again a political decision, and people can play around with what they think is appropriate given on their uh, given their tolerances for risk and their appetite for risk. On the left hand side, we have carbon removal with uh, that stores carbon for decades, centuries. 
again because it is more likely to be uh, there's likely to be a reversal event we need a higher uh, number of, of of supporting policies to manage this risk so here we have MRV uh, liability measures de-risking measures durability measures and fungibility measures and the orange circles denote things that are uh, theoretical mostly at this stage the blue circles are uh, things that are already in operation at the moment so uh, again these can be uh, moved around as as appropriate i think in reality there's a choice here between um, fungibility measures so equivalence ratios and buffer pools durability measures i think with regards to the, the, the CDR methods with shorter carbon duration, there's probably a decision there for policymakers between the two. I think there are instances where you might have all of them, but again, we need to be conscious of not over-regulating such that the, 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 the hurdle for uh, projects to become viable is too high because we need a diverse portfolio of CDR. Okay, now to just give some examples of, of how this is working in practice at the moment. So in the UK, for example, we have a combination of liability measures, MRV, and buffer pools, and that's applied to the UK Woodland Carbon Code, which is a framework for uh, growing trees. So we have a combination of all three. In the California Offset Program, we have uh, a buffer pool, um, to make up for any reversal of emissions reductions and that contribution to the buffer pool is based on uh, different risk factors um, including financial risk social risk uh, in, and disturbance risk including wildfire in new zealand we have uh, liability measures so forestry programs become a covered entity under their emissions trading scheme um, and in the event of a reversal CDR projects are liable to surrender permits equivalent to those that have been lost. So the, those projects can either go out into the market uh, and buy projects, if they uh, buy credits from other projects to make up for that shortfall, or they can surrender those that they have surplus uh, themselves. What they don't have is a buffer pool in addition to this mechanism. They, they solely rely on this type of liability measure to, to compensate for a reversal event. And then the Australian government uh, does a number of things. So um, it, it employs durability measures and liability measures. Um, but in addition to that, there are uh, there is the option for projects to uh, take some kind of discounting. So they can uh, choose to uh, a shorter period of, uh, of operation. So instead of, 100 years for a forestry project they can say this project is only going to be in operation for 25 years but because of that the projects then become discounted by 20 percent so you have a version of uh, economic discounting in conjunction with liability measures and durability measures so buffer pools and this um this slide is is taking on a, a slightly we, we didn't really cover this in the report but i think it's an, an interesting thing to to cover so what we see particularly with geological storage or, or and the precedent is set from ccs projects we we see a transfer of liability from the developers to the public uh, sector uh, after a given point in time and what underpins a lot of this is MRV. So once MRV establishes that a well is secure and there's nothing leaking, then the, the, the period at which the project is then handed over from the public, the private sector to the public sector, uh, it allows that transfer to happen. But that happens over different timescales depending on the jurisdiction. So what we're illustrating here is that the the high risk part of the project is borne by the private sector, but as the risk is decreasing, it then moves over to the, the public sector. In Louisiana, North Dakota, that period is 10 years. After 10 years post well closure, Australia, in Australia, it's 15 years. In the UK and the EU, it's 20 years. And in Montana, it's 25 years. 
And in terms of um, equity, and I, I think this is a the, the time at which this transfer is made is really important because what we don't want to do is is set the timeline uh, too 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 risky for the public sector such that the uh, privatization of benefits and the socialization of risk is tipped too far in favor of the latter. So it's really important to get this this trans the timing of this transfer right such that the public sector doesn't take on too much risk and is liable for uh, any sort of leakage. Okay, and so I'm going to finish on this, which uh, provoked a lot of contestation uh, in our previous discussions. And so this comes with a health warning, which is these classifications are based on those set out by the IPCC and not ours. They're not intended to be fixed in perpetuity. They are solely there to, to serve as a guide and people can move these technologies into different the different buckets as they wish and as, as certainly as new evidence emerges. So the starting point for this is uh, when we think about fungibility, you could determine that CDR en masse is not fungible with uh, emissions, fossil emissions reductions. That's one starting point. Or you could think of fungibility on a sliding scale. So fungibility could be uh, partial. Uh, and by that, we're talking about intrafungibility. So partial fungibility thinks of um, CDR with the same uh, storage characteristics might be fungible with each other. So CDR with um, that stores carbon for decades to century could be fungible with other technologies that store carbon for the same amount of time. So this type of fungibility is what we're calling intrafungibility. Then moving away from that, you could think of uh, all CDR is fungible, regardless of how long it stores carbon for. And here we, 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 we're terming that interfungibility, so horizontal fungibility. So uh, with intrafungibility, we're saying peatland, for example, which stores carbon for decades, a century is not equivalent with CDR that stores carbon for 10,000 years or more. If we relax that a bit further, we could say there is interfungibility. And so subject to the appropriate uh, mechanisms we outlined previously, you might be able to construct a scenario where you're comfortable with, with saying that uh, biochar is fungible with, with, with DAX. I think where we are at the paper in the paper is that we would be comfortable with intrafungibility, but we think the risks are too great to allow for interfungibility because the storage characteristics are just too different. So when it comes to integrating different types of CDR into compliance markets, this has implications. So what this framework would suggest is that decades to century CDR would not be allowed to be integrated into a compliance market because it's just not fungible. However, those technologies that are uh, more permanent, so 10,000 years or more, we would be comfortable with those technologies being integrated into a compliance market. But we need to make a distinction, a distinction in terms of the timeline for that. So we indicate short run interfungibility. So BEX and DAX more likely to be able to be integrated in the short term because the MRV uh, readiness is, is uh, or MRV is more mature, whereas uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement and enhanced weathering, the timeline for integrating those into combined market is likely to be much longer because the MRV is much more complex. And so that's a big barrier at the moment for integrating it, not just into compliance markets, but into car, uh, climate policy more generally. So. Yeah, the, the kind of takeaway from this is, is rather than thinking about fungibility as a binary thing, we think about it as a sliding scale of from no fungibility to partial fungibility, which is intrafungibility, to full fungibility, which is all CDR can be fungible with each other. So I'm going to end there and say thank you. Here is the link to the paper and some uh, posts about it, as well as our contact details, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Should I stop sharing my screen, Will? Um, yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. And so we are going to uh, move to the uh, Q&A phase and uh, I encourage everybody to uh, uh, to populate the Q&A box uh, to uh, facilitate discussion. Um, I will uh, I'll start us off uh, just uh, just a few uh, seating questions of things that I thought were uh, interesting uh, in the report, uh, maybe a little more. Uh, uh, below the below the uh, initial soil level. Uh, first uh, question is: uh, You indicated that uh, that CDR approaches that uh, only facilitate uh, permanence over over uh, decades to centuries, right? Might not be appropriate in terms of uh, integration into the compliance markets. Uh, but you you had an interesting discussion in there about the potential role of these kind of approaches in terms of uh, short-lived uh, climate forcing. And uh, that, that's a that's an issue near and dear to my heart. So I was wondering if you could expand a bit on the potential role of those approaches in that context and what that might look like. Felix, you wanna start first and I can pick up after? Yeah, I can, I can start. And maybe I, I should start by saying that we do see a role for non-permanent CDR. Um, I think that's an argument that we um, included in the report because it shouldn't be understood as we just prioritizing the uh, options with high permanence. There are um, um, applications for those. And as you already indicated, um, maybe methane emissions or others that have different um, warming potentials than CO2 um, and are emitted in agriculture. So maybe we think about um, carbon markets in agriculture. We have this discussion in the European Union now, and maybe we could include um, less permanent removals there. So this, this is where the discussion comes from. But maybe Josh, you have um, additional thoughts. Yeah, I think you make a good point. So the, the, the kind of framing for the focus on more permanent stuff is is on the premise of carbon market integration not because we see it as more valuable than less permanent cdr there is definitely a role for that um, and part of the the motivation for thinking about uh fungibility or grouping short uh, or, or non-permanent cdr together is because it opens up this possibility of alternative policy mechanisms for that group of technologies. So if we're excluding them from the compliance market, they, they need an alternative route to market. And so that's where uh, intrafungibility has some purpose and use because it can allow all of that group to enter into different mechanisms, such as, as you just outlined, Will and, and Felix, the uh, an agricultural emissions trading scheme. So we really need to create a viable business case for them. I just don't think it is the compliance market because I don't think they're fungible uh, or equivalent with, with permanent removal. So yeah, definitely keen to reiterate that we, we value non-permanent removals. It's just they're not necessarily appropriate for a integration into a carbon market or compliance carbon market. Thanks. Uh, another thing that uh, that caught my eye, we we recently uh, did a segment uh, with uh, with Kita, right? The I think the first uh, 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 dedicated CDR and insurance entity. And your report uh, talks about uh, the 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 role of of insurance in in, the, in this context. Also, I was wondering if you could expand a bit about that how do you uh, view in insurance being integrated and how important is it do you think in terms of facilitating the viability of these markets yeah so i, I think increasingly of the opinion that insurance has a, a really large role to play actually so i think the kind of latest developments are really promising so there's some of the insurance companies are moving away from just financially compensating projects for a reversal event in, in a monetary sense to actually really uh, compensating a, reverse, a, a project that's been reversed with other carbon credits. So from a climate perspective, it, it's not really that helpful to say, we've had a project that's been reversed, here's some money to build a new one, because the timeline it takes from, you know, starting that project to, to, to taking carbon out of the is too great. So from a climate perspective, what we really need is contemporaneous removals. We need almost a real-time matching of reversal with re 
sequestered carbon in terms of, of that impact. So the, 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 the movement from insurance companies to move away from sort of cash compensation to credit compensation, I think is a, a very helpful move in, in, in that regard. And so when we were thinking about some of the, the permanence mechanisms, how you bundle them together, some of the, the reasoning was to deal with that problem that just because you have a mechanism to say a company or a project needs to compensate for reversal, it doesn't help from a climate perspective if there's a lag between the reversal event and that compensation being made in some form. So that's where you need uh, the, the legal liability mechanism to enforce a company to, to, to kind of compensate for that. But that's why a buffer pool on top of that can help deal with the climate challenge uh, from a reversal event. So the layering of policies can deal with slightly distinct issues um, that are, are posed when a reversal event occurs. Yeah. Do, do you think that'll be, as these markets start to ramp up, uh, I, I agree with you, it's salutary to have uh, the ability to uh, to compensate uh, reversals with, with carbon removal. Uh, but do you think as these markets ramp up, but are still in fairly nascent stages that that will always be viable given kind of the, the shortages of, of viable carbon removal that are out there? Yeah, that's the big worry. I think, you know, a lot of this is predicated on a liquid market that mm -hmm. people can go out and just purchase a new credit for a reverse on that. You know, we, we just don't know. I, I, I don't think we can rely on the fact that this market will be readily available to dip into when, as and when we need it. So, it does worry me, which is why we sort of need some of these other policies, the buffer pools that set around projects and deal with the risk upfront, as opposed to in the future. You know, if you have a liability mechanism, it only deals with the risk in the future as and when it happens. Whereas if you have a buffer pool that sets aside credits at the start, you're dealing with the risk upfront. So matching some of these types of, of measures together can help sort of deal with those risks. All right, I'm going to ask one more question and then move to the audience questions. Uh, I, 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 as somebody on the other side of the pond, I've always been fascinated about how the EU ETS uh, works, and uh, and I thought I thought your discussion in here uh, was was really smart about the potential role of CDR in helping with what I think is probably inevitable volatility and political risk as we get toward the the end of the tail right where 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 there's uh, there's there's not a whole lot else to to be done right where credits are going to become incredibly expensive um i guess one question i had is there are there any are there any moral hazard risks right associated with saying well the the way you're going to uh, address this is is simply uh, uh make a foray into cdr markets Yeah, I can start maybe, and and then Josh. Uh, so I think once you start managing the cap in the cap and trade system, there are always moral hazards, and it's very difficult to decide how to manage the cap. And including CDR, um, we should be honest about is is about uh, managing the cap. So I think what we need is very um, um, credible institutions to decide about the amount of CDR, about the type of CDR that we integrate in the market. And this is an open question also in the European Union. I've been involved in a proposal for a European Carbon Central Bank um, using the image of a central bank as an independent institution that decides about this question, these questions that I just raised. So I think we are just at the beginning of this discussion, but I completely agree that we should talk about these moral hazards because they are there. Anything else to add, Josh? Just to, you know, we, we want, so one of the kind of mechanisms to avoid some of this is to have separate targets. And if, if we throw a lot of these uh, different CDR methods into the carbon market and say they're all fungible, in practice, I think that makes it very difficult to tease out some of these different targets or separate targets as, mm -hmm. as a governance mechanism. So I just think we need to be, to be wary of that. If that is our main, one of our main tools for, you know, managing the, the, the moral hazard risk. Okay. All right, let's move to uh, to some of the uh, uh, the questions from our audience. Uh, first question is from uh, 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 Max Johansson. It says, uh, can you explain the time versus risk 
graphic a little more, having trouble understanding exactly why the risk automatically goes down over time and what time the x-axis is representing. Okay, you're testing me a bit. Let me just bring that up. So the, the graphic itself is, is very much illustrative in that uh, the reason that the, 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 the ownership is transferred is because the government's deem that the risk prof profile is, is small, the risk is small, and that for, therefore they're happy to take move the risk onto their own balance sheet so the the, the kind of the the gradient of the of the the chart and is very much as if it's not sort of uh specific really but um it's it's again i'm sort of reaching a bit but the the the, the risk that the sea that the well is going to leak after a uh, after it's been closed capped and monitored for 20 years at that point it transfers over to the, the to the government they will, they're presumably quite happy at the level of risk having monitored it for so long and seen how little leakage there has been. So I think uh, that's the kind of basis for transferring that risk over to the, to, to the public balance sheet. Okay. All right, thanks for that. Um, now, if, you, if you've ever seen one of our episodes, you know uh, biochar is always front and center uh, in our consideration. So we have a couple biochar questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask them uh, uh, in seriatim. Uh, the first one is from uh, John Asri. Hope I pronounced your name right, John. Uh, where in this cycle do you see biochar created from forest waste uh, sequestered through regenerative agriculture? Felix, <laughs> no, it's 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 it's. Um, I can't answer this question, but I can uh, tell you that we got several of these after the publication of the report about very specific biochar applications. Yep, and that's we that, are that's aware a big of, part of, of our community. <laughs> yeah, and we are aware of the discussions, and that's also why Josh uh, stressed during the presentation that the classification can change. So we use the IPCC classification, and. We are completely aware that there might be biochar applications that could count into another category at some point. Um, and this is sort of ongoing um, um, knowledge production. So it's not like it's there forever. And yeah, as I said, we are aware of the big community working on biochar having opinions about this. And we really encourage, like we, we acknowledge that it's important to have this discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, th I think biochar is a really interesting test case for the whole kind of fungibility discussion. Um, and we're seeing it in the EU, at least with, with the CRCF in that, you know, there is a huge upside and reward for being classified as permanent or in the kind of decades to centuries bucket, because it gives you potentially access to a large revenue stream in the form of the compliance carbon market. So fungibility is, is not really a technocratic decision. It's based on economics, it's based on science, it's based on lobbying, it's based on vested interests that all go into that decision to create, you know, and, and create this concept of fungibility. So we're very much aware of that and, and biochar is front and centre of those discussions, I think, um, as we found out since publication. Okay, well... <laughs> Apropos of that, your second biochar question uh, I, uh, from uh, uh, from Brian uh, uh, Eagle uh, Glanris. Uh, I'm still confused why biochar is shown as decades to centuries when the data from many studies point to centuries to thousands of years. Yeah, for the for the, for the same reason. So the IPCC classify it as decades to centuries. We've just used their classifications, but you know. The, the way we've grouped this is it's a framework and it's adaptable and people can shift around the technologies into the buckets that they think are most appropriate. If you can make a good argument that biochar sits in the centuries to millennia bucket on the right hand side, then you can make the case that it's eligible for carbon market inclusion. Equally, if people think it isn't and it deserves and it sits in a in a bucket of uh, it's a carbon storage grouping of, of shorter timelines, then it doesn't fit in the carbon market. So it's kind of at the discretion of policymakers to, to say what they think is the most appropriate uh, fitting based on the best available and latest evidence, which is very much uh, is quickly emerging and developing. All right, next question uh, from uh, uh, Kyle Clark Sutton. 
Uh, do you have any perspective on horizontal stacking of credits to create a, a synthetic or hybrid ton where you combine a low permanence credit that's linked uh, in the future to a high permanence credit uh, when when costs decline, right? There's a discussion, right? The 6.4 uh, body was obviously lo looked a lot at that uh, also. Any any thoughts about that role? Um, can we say yeah, um, I, I can go first. Um, I think it's a very interesting idea because it addresses the problem of permanent CDR not being available right now um, in in at large scale at least. So that's why it's like relevant to discuss. But I also see problems like coming looking at it from the EU ETS perspective. Um, there are some challenges of how to integrate it, like in terms of how to op operationalize it um, and how to bridging the different sectors where these removals come from in terms of accounting. So um, good idea, but will be challenging to implement it in compliance markets. Um, but we should continue the discussion on this idea. Yeah, we 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 try to touch on this a bit. So in the typology of measures, we under the liability category, we have perpetual removal, which is a form of horizontal horizontal stacking, if you like. So companies are obligated. So if they buy a credit that lasts for 50 years, they're obligated to at year 50 automatically forward by another project for 50 years. So they can kind of perpetually keep uh, removing carbon in uh, over time. The challenge with this is it depends on the type of project you're buying. If it's a uh, short, a kind of afforestation project, that's supplanted by a DAC project that uh, one means the DAC project has to be there, but at least the cost curves of those projects are anticipated to come down over the time. The challenge is if that you're horizontally stacking non-permanent CDR projects, the cost curves of those go up over time. So if you're buying a 50 year, a, a, a new afforestation project 50 years in the future, but you're not buying it, you're not making the transaction until 50 years hence, the cost might be too prohibitive for you to actually be able to afford that. And you also have to be an operation and solvent as a company in 50 years time. So neither of those are, are, are a certainty. So I like the idea and it has sort of uh, in, intellectual interest, you know, interest, but uh, yeah, I think practically these are things are quite challenging to, to operationalize. Okay. All right, uh, next uh, question. Uh, and again, I apologize if I uh, mangle your name, uh, Jos uh, Kojinsen. Uh, I'm happy your report discusses economic fungibility, uh, needed to link it to the mandatory market, and we need a lot. Uh, don't you think that since the different lifetimes, 20 years, 40 years, 100 years, uh, can be calculated, is interfungibility then not only a matter of doing uh, the then not only a matter of doing the match conservatively, that's the first part of the question. I just need to get my head around that for a minute. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I get it correctly. If If the argument is that we can just do the math and that is so that we can include so that is why we can include all methods in the um compliance market well yeah i mean you could argue that but i think there one big risk about this approach is that if we have the non-permanent approaches methods in the compliance markets um they will be much cheaper than permanent cdr and they will sort of crowd out the permanent and high quality cdr as um, um so the prices maybe will never go down if it like Put it provocatively. So I think that's an argument against this, and um, to have to keep it separated. Um, and I think another argument is it's not only the permanence. Um, CDR methods also differ in terms of other impacts they have on the environment, also the core benefits they have. And I think integration into market should also consider this. And I think that that's another reason why we should keep um, the methods um, separate. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, maybe Josh, you have you you got your head around. Uh, I'm still grappling with it, but I think you make an important point. We're often focusing on the issues of of just permanence, but there are other uh, market impacts. So, as Felix said, 
lower cost CDR might lower the price uh, in the compliance market, which then might not incentivize more expensive, more durable and additional CDR. So there are other kind of non-permanent issues that we also need to, to think about here. And that sort of can be tempered if you're allowing lower cost land-based projects in your own country. So I think of the UK, for example, those forestry projects will be much more expensive than forestry projects in other parts of the world. So there is a sort of tempering effect depending on if you allow international credits or, or CR projects or, or domestic projects, but overall you just need to be conscious that these projects that are lower cost don't uh, depress market prices too much. All right, next uh, question from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Brad Warren. Um, in evaluating policies that transfer risk to the public sector, there's many examples of industries getting deals that offload most risk to public. Uh, two examples, some US states are liable for old uh, leaky oil wells instead of drillers. And then the Price-Anderson Act in the United States for nuclear plants socializes liability above a threshold. Uh, Josh, you mentioned an interest in preventing excessive transfer of risk to the public. Isn't that a tall risk politically? How can governments in the real world prevent industries from offloading risk in this way? Do some jurisdictions provide examples of successfully holding that line? Yeah, good, very good point. I think um, uh, it is really it is really challenging and. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Um, bear with me one sec. Yeah, so one of the one of the kind of maybe promising things here is is insurance. So or 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 we see it in the kind of mining industries where governments use liability mechanisms to give them recourse to go back to a company uh, to, to compensate or mitigate any sort of uh, event that's uh, damaging to the environment. And, and the worry is that companies might just declare them bankrupt and absolve themselves from, from, uh, from, from having to do anything. But uh, you, governments could make use of a combination of liability mechanisms or reinsurance mechanisms to, to kind of um, to, to, to help with that. Um, I think I don't have examples of jurisdictions doing some of those things, but I think the mining sector, there's some examples of where uh, that's been used effectively. Okay. Uh, let's see. A uh, question from uh, uh, Rutzel uh, Killian. Uh, in your view, what speaks most against an integration of non permanent CDR into compliance markets in combination with a European? Uh, a carbon central bank as suggested by uh, Edenhofer and Kalkul? Uh, I think we discussed a few points on 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 that already. Um, so it's it's the prices, it's the risks, it's the also the co-benefits. I think we we need a way to address the co-benefits as well. And I'm not sure that a market integration is the right way to do that. It, it may be, but we need to explore it. Um, however, um, when discussing the European Carbon Central Bank, you could also think of this bank as being capable of sort of managing a portfolio of different methods, managing the risks also that are related to different uh, methods. So I, I wouldn't rule out it. Wouldn't, wouldn't it? Like I wouldn't rule out this option. But um, I think the risks are higher that that we will. Uh, miss the opportunity to scale up high quality CDR if we include all of them in the ETS. That's the main argument I would um, have against it. I've just remembered what I was going to say on the, on the last question. So I'll, I'll just that very quickly. So I, I think regardless of the, the mechanisms we put in place, I think we all have to recognize that governments are the de facto backstop for reversal events under UNFCCC anyway. So we can we can try and sort of hold companies accountable for the event of a reversal then or in the uk under its uh, interim carbon budgets if we breach a carbon budget the government is the de facto backstop the public is the de facto backstop anyway so 
that's just kind of broader framing for transfer of liability, no matter what, whether it's 10 years or 20 years, whatever time period you use, the government is still going to be liable under its climate change obligations from a from a legal perspective or its domestic climate change targets as well. Okay. All right. Uh, next question uh, from uh, uh, Justine uh, Mwanje. How would the typology of policy measures to deliver the tenets of good governance of CDR in the short to uh, medium term? So I think if the government's followed the sequencing, so it starts with good MRV, that's the basis for all good governance. And then the integration into CDR, into policy can then follow. So that's kind of what we would think of, of, of good governance following this, this sequencing so that you get the MRV right. It's robust, it's reliable. We know the CDR methods are doing what they are intended to do, delivering public benefits as well as removing carbon. And then over time, you can start integrating CDR into, into policy architectures. I would, I would worry if we sort of skip stage one and move straight into, uh, into stage three. I think at least in the UK and the EU, we are moving forward first with that kind of uh, MRV legislation and design, and then it's going to be integrated into policy after. And I think that's a good sequencing for, for good governance. Anything to add on that, Felix? Okay. All right. Uh, let me wedge one one final question in here from Brad Warren also. Uh, Felix, you make a case for keeping CDR separate from existing offset markets. Would that amount to a case for creating a distinct CDR market along the lines of Klaus Lochner's proposed ton for ton uh, removal mandate, right? Otherwise known as, I think, carbon take back obligations. Mm, yeah, I think, well, I'm not arguing against including CDR in compliance markets. I'm arguing that we shouldn't include all methods in compliance markets as we know them. Um, so that's, I think, an important um, um, element there. And then I think we it's a good idea to think about um, distinct CDR markets or CDR-only markets. Um, we mentioned the the less permanent removal methods. Um, we could think of a market just for them, for example. Um, there are also ideas out there for, for having a distinct emission trading scheme or removal trading scheme and not including it. Um, I think, again, we are early in this debate and we need to explore all options. I'm not ruling out these options. And I think countries will also have very different responses to this. And I'm not saying that everybody should follow the UETS uh, um, example or something like that. And maybe even the UK and the EU will will take different decisions on on that. Um, yeah, and the removal market. Back to the question. I think we should also explore this. Anything to add, Josh? Okay. All right. Um, we are almost at the uh, bewitching hour. Uh, I'd ask uh, Felix and Josh if they have any any final uh, thoughts before we uh, close. Thank you for your for your engagement and the opportunity to to present this. It's uh, yeah a very much a live discussion, and uh, yeah, look forward to carrying working on this. Okay, all right, and uh, thanks to uh, uh, to Josh and and Felix for uh, for an excellent summation of this uh, report and all of the uh, thoughtful questions as always. Uh, I think uh, we have really reached a point when it comes to carbon removal that uh, that the the governance and social science and economic and business aspects uh, need to uh, to catch up in many ways with uh, with technological assessment. And uh, and I think a report like this really emphasizes where the rubber meets the road in uh, in being able to effectively operationalize the, these uh, approaches. So uh, I encourage everybody to uh, uh, to take a look at the at the report and hopefully, uh, it ends up in the, the hands of, of, of thoughtful policymakers. So once again, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, please uh, uh, look out for our announcement, and we hope you will uh, join us again. And with that, I will say goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.